Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwell. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lockwell here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Market mayhem, the S&P 500 drops to a 22-month low. As the Fed's Loretta Mester says, U.S. recession will not stop Fed hikes. Popularity contest, the U.K.'s Labour Party surges to the biggest poll lead over the Tories in over two decades in the wake of Liz Truss's mini-budget. Plus, crisis talks, EU energy ministers are set to approve emergency intervention, but a deal on a gas cap remains elusive. So good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. We've made it just barely to Friday. So I want to applaud everyone who have had a pretty volatile week when it comes to the markets. Now, some of the volatility or certainly some of the turmoil that we saw in the last five days now, um, you know, abating a little bit. European stocks gaining 1%. Uh, there's a potential recovery, of course, after the tumultuous week in the markets. So FTSE currently gaining 7 tenths of 8%. The S&P 500 futures, after that huge move in U.S. markets yesterday, also gaining a touch. Now, the dollar is pretty much steady. The pound actually rising as once again investors weighing some of the risks emanating from the debt crisis gripping the UK. So I don't know if we have a currency moves or whether we just go straight uh, to the European map. But overall, it's the fears of this global recession mounting as a threat of higher uh, rates are is sapping growth. So the market in the balance today focusing, of course, on the ECB, maybe some of the earnings as we also uh, are at the end of a quarter and so there's a bit of positioning on portfolios. Now British Prime Minister Liz Truss's sweeping tax cuts may end up being bad news for mortgage holders. That's telling. Well, these are fears that the BOE will have to hike more to compensate for looser fiscal policy. Joining us now is Marcus Ashworth from Bloomberg Opinion and Agnes Belaish, Bering's chief European economist. So thank you both for joining us. Um, Marcus, I mean, look, what is going on? So Pound has had a pretty crazy volatile week. Week, BOE intervened for financial stability. What happens next week? Ah, well, I would like to say that the, the, the worst of the crisis uh, is over. I think the Bank of England has acted uh, admirably here and stepped in and done exactly the right thing. And I don't think it will be anything close to 65 billion they'll end up buying. It may be as little as 10 to 15 billion, but we're seeing uh, sort of only about one, one and a quarter billion coming through each day. But we go out to uh, the next two weeks, the middle of October, and then, then in theory they stop. The question will then be is whether the Bank of England feels brave enough to reassert its active continental tightening program at the back end of the month. I think that might get pushed out to next year. But we'll have to see how things are, are, are coming on. It's the end of the quarter and the end of the sort of half year end for Japanese investors. So I think this next couple of days, um, we should think, see things calm down as we go into uh, the fourth quarter. But it's a, it was a horrid scare for the UK, and I, I'm hoping that things will settle down. But there are some major underlying problems with the structure of the market, for sure. Yeah, so Agnes, how, how do you, what do you think the BOE does next? So the BOE is sort of giving the government a second chance. It's uh, telling the government that they're going to wait for uh, the assessment of the Office for Budget Responsibility before taking policy action. And that's very wise, and you can see all the experience of Governor Bailey. However, if the government doesn't take that second chance and doesn't come with a funding program for its uh, generous fiscal package, then the BOE will not flinch, and that's when it's going to be difficult for everyone. So, Agnes, I mean, I know it's extremely difficult, actually, to see what happens in the kind of scenario. Uh, given you think the BOE has given them a second chance, I mean, how do we find out what the government wants to do? Do we just wait for them to tell us, or do you look at signals from the OBR? It's very difficult and uncertain times for, for you know, part of, part of these markets. I think the government is getting the signal. I, I believe seriously that they will come with a financing plan. It's a matter of time. They hadn't realized that uh, this was part of what they needed to announce. There are a number of measures that they can use. They can cut some spending. They can also introduce some new taxes. There is a battery of instruments that they can use. Um, they, I, I seriously think they will, they, they will consider what it is that they can do. Um, they, they, they are basically selling um, households a call option where they are offering to, where the government is offering to sell households as much energy as, as, as they want at a fixed price that's below the cost uh, to energy companies. Uh, the huge, uh, the, the, the losses can be huge. And I think this is a uh, downing on them that uh, financing those losses um, is necessary for some coherence in this program, which by itself, if it was funded, would not be that bad. 
Um, Agnes, we're also getting some breaking news out of the BOJ. It's boosting some long, super long uh, JGB buying for October and December. Marcus, this is basically, I guess, some of the fault lines are central banks around the world getting ready. We have seen the BOJ in the past actually not wanting to intervene too much. I don't know whether this experiment works or not, but if you look at what happened in the UK, is it really a warning signal, Marcus, for other countries in Europe? And, you know, how do other central banks around the world react? No, it's usually. I mean, the Bank of Japan, we always thought was going to be the one that would break first, not the Bank of England. Um, the structure of the UK pension industry um, has perhaps caused the fault line. No one fully appreciated how serious it was. But the Bank of Japan, they are just underlying again and again. They're prepared to defend or right to the very end uh, as far as the things that they can control, what they want to do, which is break their cycle of deflation. Now, the only major central bank that needs to do that uh, feels it still needs to do it and is continuing to do it. Um, I think what we think with the Bank of England with the warning was that they, they quickly had to revert back to QE. And that really is the warning that the European Central Bank in particular should take. You know, UK has a unique little problem in its pensioning, but the wider problem of what's happening with a strong dollar and rising US yields, forcing everything else up, is what's going to cause breakages across. We saw uh, weirdly in the UK, but it's evident that the problem is coming with that inflation close to 11% in Germany. The ECB has got a real dilemma whether they're going to cause a recession, which I think believe they will do. They continue to hike rates too hard. And that's why I think the Bank of England, despite all this stuff, won't go as much as perhaps markets thinking. Yeah, and this also, you know, Agnes, overall, how you put it is basically markets are licking their wounds before being caught up, you know, in these different signals between fiscal and monetary policy. How, how much will this impact decisions in other countries in Europe? Everybody is looking at the UK. The UK has grabbed the headlines again. Um, with quite a daring plan and, you know, other countries in Europe have had a debt crisis already. They have put together a straight jacket of a budget process so that uh, such things would never happen there. But I think the route on the, you know, UK guilt market um, is telling them to really look at what's happening with positioning in long uh, maturity bonds and what type of uh, selling off of fire sales might happen if the regulation is too tight on this or the other. I think that's the experience that everyone is looking at, this financial stability concern. I think Europe and the euro area more specifically would not have any chance to meet such a, I mean, to, to, to show such a an badly designed uh, budget plan. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Marcus, I guess, you know, the other question is, do, do you think QE for financial stability was right? Was it right for the BOE to use that? Oh, absolutely. And that's exactly what it needed to do. I, I, I wish I could agree with Agnes on her last points, but I mean, this is exactly the type of attitude that in 2011 got Europe into so much pain. There was a lot of problems with European financing. You just have to look at Italy's debt GDP and the structural rollover they have to finance. It won't be like the UK, it will be different. But the basic problem here is that massively high, uh, higher interest rates are going to cause all sorts of problems in weak and unstable economies, which will obviously have a ma major crisis with Ukraine and energy. So I don't think we can be complacent on this at all. And I think that all the central banks have to be very careful as they step forward here. But the singular fight against inflation, trying to land economies on a head of a pin of a 2% inflation target, is looking backwards and not looking forward to how the structure of the economy is changing. So I hope there'll be a little bit more flexibility coming from the central bankers and learning a, le a horrible lesson which the, U the UK has delivered. It is unique to the UK in certain ways, but it, the broader problem is universal, I'm afraid. Agnes? Well, the EU has a straight jacket of a budget process with a lot of unpalatable um, peer reviews of each member state's budget. So in terms of budgeting, which is the source of the financial instability in the US, the lack of funding for the budget, that cannot happen in uh, the, neither the European Union nor the euro area. There is a two-pack, the six-pack, the European semester. The European Commission has to give its feedback on every single uh, national budget. Every government has to provide a national budget by the 15th of October every single year. And, um, and the peer review ensures that there is no incoherence in the budget. And that's as clear as that. After what happens on the market and what central banks yeah. can do or will do and whether they, 
this very complicated transitioning process out of very easy financing conditions, that can create trouble. But the problem in the euro area will not come from unfunded budgets. Okay, thank you. I mean, I'm loving this Marcus Agnes combo, so we'll get you back on together. Marcus Ashworth there from Bloomberg <laughs> Opinion. Agnes Belaish, Bering's chief European strategist, stays with us. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Hurricane Ian is regaining strength over the Atlantic and set to make landfall in South Carolina later today. That's after leaving a path of destruction across central Florida, destroying homes, roads and the power grids and leading to unprecedented floods. Power was knocked out to more than 2.6 million homes and businesses. ABC News reports at least nine people have now been killed. Meanwhile, President Biden has denounced Russia's plan to absorb occupied regions of Ukraine as a flagrant violation of sovereignty and territorial integrity. Moscow says it plans to sign what it calls treaties in Ukraine's east today. This comes after referendums on annex annexations condemned as illegal by the United United Nations. HSBC is considering vacating its global headquarters in London's Canary Wharf when its lease expires in early 2027. According to an internal memo, the bank is aiming to create a more flexible workspace. Options include renovating the existing building or moving to a new premises in the British capital. The company says it's not planning to leave London. And a full Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton is to be auctioned in Hong Kong in November and may fetch up to $25 million. The fossil named Sheen was unearthed in Montana and is around 66 million years old. So if you're wondering if you've got enough space, well, Sheen is about 13 meters long and weighs in at 1.4 tons. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Guerin. This is Bloomberg, Francine. I'm crowdfunding for it. I think my husband sent me like 25 emails saying like, what are you nuts? But hey, you know what? If I get the crowdfunding, maybe we'll display it at Bloomberg LP. Coming up, EU energy ministers meet in Brussels to try and come up with joint measures to tackle the ongoing energy crisis. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition of Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, EU energy ministers gather in Brussels today as the bloc fights to come up with a joint measure to tackle the ongoing energy crisis that risks upending European economies. Joining us now from Brussels is our Maria today. So, Maria, what's the outlook for the energy ministers? How much does the price relief help and how different is country to country? Uh, yes, Francine, and uh, today we heard from pretty much every energy minister here saying this is now an energy war. We fight an energy war with Russia. The winter crisis is already starting. We're in September, but it is really here and it's happening already. We have to bring down prices. Now, there has been some relief, as you alluded to, from the heights uh, that we saw back in August at the end of the month, where it really did seem like something was broken in the energy market that has provided some relief, but everyone here agrees that it's not enough and bills have to go down. Now, the issue, Francine, fundamentally today, and this is a real tension that you can really pick up in this place, is the cap. Do you put a limit on pr gas prices? And there's a number of ideas that have been floated, but the sense that we have is that right now there isn't consensus. The Energy Commissioner, however, she did say something interesting. She doubled down on a cap on Russia, but then also talked about negotiating in good faith with countries that are friends of the EU, referring potentially to Algeria, mm -hmm. Norway, and so on. But for the time being, the impression that we get is we're very far from anything that looks like a consensus plan. Yeah, and Maria, later today, Vladimir Putin also expects to make a speech in Moscow and formally annex territories. So what happens after that? 
Yeah, and for European leaders, they already say that they will not agree to this, that this is illegal, it is a fake, it's a phony to think that a vote could be held in a country that is literally at war and Russia get away with a massive land grab is, nay, not just escalation, but also provides or paves a way for more sanctions. The other thing that will feature in this uh, meeting today also is the leaks around the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. Ministers here agree that there was sabotage going into this, and they say they have many questions and want to find out exactly who did this and also what is the purpose, what is the point of doing this. So overall, it does point to a week of big geopolitical escalation when it comes to Russia. Thank you so much, Armia Tadeo. They're on the ground, of course, for us in Brussels. Now, Agnes Belaish, Barings, chief European economist, is still with us. Agnes, when you look at the energy price cap announced by Germany, what they've designed compared to other countries, can the bloc stay together and speak with a united front? Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly one more um, reason for which the the bloc is speaking with one voice and is designing policies that doesn't leave anyone behind. I know it's, it's a formula, but it's actually quite impressive what they're doing. Because what the EU is going to announce and is preparing is actually a common set of um, tax raising or revenue raising taxes, I should say, that would en enable every country to actually finance their energy support package that can shield consumers and small and medium enterprises. Um, they, they have been preparing these measures for a long while. That's what they're going to discuss today in this uh, emergency energy meeting. They will consider them next week again at the Eurogroup and later down the road at European councils. So it is something of a uniform policy blanket that every country won't have to design for itself, but can just apply uh, for its own um, population. And some countries, of course, have already done it. Um, Agnes, and I know you know you were saying basically also because of the straight jacket that the body of the EU regulations provide come in handy to you know avoid this, this fiscal credibility crisis, and you argued that very well against some of Marcus's points. When you look at the energy complex in general, I mean, how many companies could go un under? Does the European economy remind you of what we lived through in 2007 before the financial crisis? Well, so, so governments. Um, are um, considering energy companies like they would systemic banks. And they are ready to bail them out, having understood how important it is for the simple functioning of the economy and livelihood of the population. Um, so their fiscal uh, balances are quite healthy, at least in Germany, which is the country most directly affected with the highest dependence on gas for its energy consumption. Um, and there, you know, they have nationalized Uniper. They have uh, already a plan to inject financing. They have uh, come up with a budget with a fiscal deficit of 3.5% of GDP. Um, debt is around 70% of GDP at the start of the year. So they would have room to do so. This is an exceptional circumstances for them. So Germany stands apart in this plan. Um, some companies might go under, but the bailout will be there from the state. And, of course, it's Germany that's the most directly affected. Agnes, thank you so much for all of the insight. Agnes Belanche there, Bering's chief European econ strategist. Now, coming up, GDP data this morning shows the UK has narrowly avoided a recession for now. Ahead of Liz Truss's first Conservative Party conference as leader, we break down the extreme UK market moves of the past week. That's a little bit later in the program. This is Bloomberg. Finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance or the edition on Francine Lacqua here in London. We're just getting a bit of breaking news. China FX body said to ask banks to trade yuan closer to fixing. Now, this uh, comes, of course, for party politics, and usually when China asks, it gets done. So I don't know if we have a ribbon and chart or whether we'll get that to you. It'll probably take a couple of other days, well, more days uh, for it actually to play out. Let's also get to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Meta has outlined sweeping plans to reorganize teams and reduce headcount for the very first time. CEO Mark Zuckerberg says he is freezing hiring and restructuring some new 
units to trim expenses and realign priorities. He also said Meta will likely be smaller in 2023 than it was this year. It is the company's first major budget cut since Facebook was founded in 2004. Now, Canada's National Housing Agency is set to revise its forecast, saying house prices will drop as much as 15 percent by the middle of 2023 from levels seen earlier this year. It says higher mortgage rates threaten to cause a protracted slump in real estate. Its July forecast was for a 5 percent slide. SoftBank Group is said to have started laying off employees at its loss-making vision fund. Bloomberg has learned that it is expected to cut at least 30 percent of staff from the London-based unit, which has about 500 employees. The vision fund recently posted a $23 billion loss, with most of that coming from a plunge in valuations from its portfolio companies. And Amazon is to close all but one of its U.S. call centers and shift hundreds of office employees to remote work in an effort to save on real estate. The e-commerce giant has been seeking to reduce expenses as sales growth slows amid rising inflation and also economic uncertainty. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francie. Thank you so much, Leanne. This is the picture for the markets. Stocks actually dropping in Asia. Today, they seem to be stabilizing in Europe, but it is also the end of the quarter. So look out for any dollar swings. This is Bloomberg. Market mayhem. The S&P 500 drops to a 22-month low as the Fed's Loretta Mester says the U.S. recession will not stop Fed hikes. Popularity contest. The U.K.'s Labour Party surges to the biggest poll lead over the Tories in over two decades in the wake of Liz Trust's mini-budget. Plus, crisis talks. EU energy ministers are set to approve emergency intervention, but a deal on a gas cap remains elusive. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, the U.K. economy grew in the second quarter, averting a summer recession despite the cost of living crisis. The news will be welcomed by the government, which has been hit by a run on the pound and a financial crisis since a mini-budget lost Friday. Well, for all of this, we're joined by Lizzie Burden. So, first of all, Lizzie, break down the latest eco data for us. Well, Francine, I have to cast a healthy dose of scepticism on this. Yes, GDP uh, surprised uh, better than the estimate. I should say, for Q2, but that just means the slump is delayed. We are expecting a slump from the second, uh, the third quarter, when, of course, we had the National Bank holiday for the Queen's funeral, and the sombre national mood is likely to have weighed on sentiment. We also had uh, the house price figures from Nationwide this morning. They showed that there was no growth in September. It's the first time that's happened in more than a year. So you are starting to see uh, the weight of inflation and higher interest rates on the housing market. So, yes, the government might well welcome this news about the second quarter GDP and the pound's recovery, but on the pound, that is more likely to be perhaps because the Bank of England has shown yeah. that it's willing to step in. So, Lizzie, what's the mood heading into the Conservative Party conference this weekend? Not good, I imagine. No, bleak. This poll from the Times uh, from YouGov shows that Labour's got a 33-point lead. It's the biggest lead for any political party in 20 years. And, of course, it comes back to the budget. Now, behind the scenes, Kwasi Kwarteng is pleading with Tory MPs to get behind the economic policies. But what we're hearing is that lots of them want him to resign so that Liz Truss has the political cover to reverse these tax cuts. But that's not looking likely. Her, Kwarteng and uh, Kemi Badenoch, the Trade Secretary, came out yesterday defending the plans. Uh, and so it's, it's bleak going into this conference when you've got uh, big heavyweights like Rishi Sunak staying in his constituency to give trust space. Lizzie, thanks so much. Lizzie Burden there with the very latest on the UK. So let's stay on the story. Joining us now is the former Bank of England Deputy Governor. He is Sir John Geeve. Thank you so much for joining us. How was your week? Uh, exciting, hasn't Eventful, it? Eventful. Yeah. I guess it is is maybe one way of putting it. Do you think that actually Bank of England using QE for financial stability was a good idea? 
Yeah, I think if you look at the results, I mean, they, they faced an unstable market because some pension funds, and I guess other people too, had been caught out by the speed of the move on gilts and were facing collateral calls which were causing them to sell assets. So there was a risk of a spiral developing, and they did stop that, and they've done that effectively. But, of course, that's only a short-term move. So they've said very clearly, that's not QE, we're going to stop in a fortnight. We're just giving people a, few, a pause in which they can sort out their affairs, and then we're going to get back to selling gilts. So it's a pause, not a change. But it is also, it does set a precedence. So actually, how bad does it have to get in other parts of the market for the BOE to intervene? Well, uh, the, the bank's got two remits. One's to get inflation down. That's why it's selling gilts. That's why it's putting up interest rates. The other is to keep markets stable. And I think, yeah, this is an... Uh, I, I can't remember a similar occasion when they've stepped in into that particular market so forcefully. And... Um, uh, and to do whatever it takes. I mean, it was... It was it, they were taking on the sellers and saying, we will absorb yeah. it. And that, that had the impact they wanted. Uh, would they do it in other markets? I guess they would if they thought it was going to disrupt the rest of the economy. And what was happening in, in, in those markets was that as long-term interest rates began to be very volatile, the bank stopped their mortgage offers. So they didn't know how to price their mortgage offers. So you could see a direct impact from this sort of rather arcane derivatives market to the high street and mortgage offers. But do you think QE should have always been used as a financial stability tool? Is that actually the best usage of it? Well, no. I think uh, the bank would say this isn't QE. This is a limited market intervention. <laughs> QE is something different. QE is what you do when interest rates are near zero and you, you can't reduce them any further. Uh, I, th I think genuinely there are two completely different motives at work here. And I don't think the bank wants to get into the business of underwriting every financial market. So right. this was a special occasion, and I think it's worked, but it doesn't resolve anything. The, the, you know, right. this, is, this, this storm isn't over. And, and I mean, you're, you're mentioning the fact that, you know, they could go back to their previous plans in two weeks. Is that, like, very optimistic? It could take longer, right, if, the, if something doesn't give. Yeah, I think on the... The particular point that they were targeting was this collateral calls on, on derivatives yeah, on linked to interest year. rate mm -hmm. swaps and the pension yes. funds and so on. And basically, high interest rates are good for pension funds, so they are more solvent than they were. This was a real cash flow problem. So I think a two-week intervention should give them enough time to get their cash flow in order. So I think they will stop in a, in a fortnight, but of course, that may lead to gilts falling again because, and, and, and two weeks after that, on October the 31st, they've said they're going to resume selling gilts. So it's, uh, I think if they <laughs> find at the mid-October that they can't stop underpinning the gilts market, that would, be, that would be very serious and would take them into new territory. So I'm, I'm expecting them to do what they say. Do, but are you expecting more market dislocations? Again, as we try and understand what the government will do with this mini-budget, their relationship to the OBR, and, and also how, how markets react to it? Yeah, well, there, there are two things unresolved from this week. Firstly, the banks, what's it going to do with interest rates? I mean, the expectations have gone right up. People are talking about one and a quarter, one and a half percentage point increases at the next meeting. So expectations are very high that they're going to tighten policies sharply. But we don't know about that. Uh, the second thing is the government has uh, said it's going to publish its fiscal medium-term plans, it's going to have a proper forecast, but only at the end of November. Yeah. So we've had the good bits of the budget, i.e. the giveaways, yeah. didn't go down too well, but nonetheless, I mean, that was the nice bit, cutting taxes. What they haven't explained is what does that mean for spending in the medium term? And I think they've got some really difficult political yeah. choices to make. I mean, you see in today's papers, they're talking about maybe cutting benefits. Now, it's one thing to say you're cutting tax on the best paid people, but it's all right, it's all on borrowing. If you're saying, well, we're cutting, cutting tax for the best paid people, but actually we're now going to squeeze the poorest people into, in order to pay for it, 
these have, yeah. I think they face a real difficulty in, in producing those medium term plans. And those two big uncertainties remain. And I suspect that they will have to do something before the end of November in order to clarify where they're going and how they're going to pay for these tax cuts. So given these unknowns, given what's priced into the market, what do you think the BOE should do? H how big a hike can they afford to do you know, in, in the coming weeks? Well, the bank has, has uh, felt it's really pushed the boat out in going on 50 basis points. And I think they'll probably have to do more. And the comments from Hugh Pill suggest that they're talking about something, uh, something big next time. Um, they won't have decided yet, but my guess is that they'll want to raise rates up towards or up to the level that they are in America. Um, I think that there's a real... What this, this week has shown is, a, is the market's real doubts about the credibility of the economic policy makers in Britain. Yep. And I think the bank must show its independence and its willingness to take tough action. So I'm expecting um, at the next, they hope to wait yeah. till November, at the next meeting they'll probably go up by three quarters percent or even one percent yeah. in order, as I say, to close the gap with American yeah. rates. Can they really wait until the next meeting? Again, it, it's a difficult, if they act before, then it could, you know, spread a sense of panic, but, but it also feels like a very long time away. Yeah, well, I agree with that, and um, and I say they've stabilised the markets, and there's been a poor, a, a, a calm for the last day. Uh, that's just one day. Yeah, absolutely. Things, more things could happen, and we've seen they they didn't intend to do this a week ago. They intended to start selling gilts. So. I'm not making any yeah. promises or predictions about how easy it will yeah. be to fill that gap. I think if the government sets out during the next month a credible medium-term fiscal plan, yeah. the bank probably won't have to step in again with special measures. Mm -hmm. If they don't, then I think some of these political difficulties yeah. in creating a plan like that people are going to think, well, can they really do it? And then markets may get nervous again. So uh, we talk often to Mark Kearney about climate change, and he's always said, I don't want to talk about the UK economy. So for him to give an interview means that he, he was quite alarmed about what's going on in the UK. And he says, look, Liz Truss has really put in credibility of the UK institutions in this. Do, what does that mean for, for the UK, for UK businesses, for the UK economy? Do, do you think outside investors are now questioning the country. Yeah, well, I'm another ex making comments about what my, uh, what my the current do people often. are doing. But I, um, I, think it, um, I think it's put the, the, the institutions to test. But actually, the last week has strengthened the hand of the Bank of England and, in fact, the Office of Budget Responsibility, who do the independent forecasts. I mean, now, she's meeting them today, um, the government's got to accept what they, what they produce. So, although uh, people may have wor worried that she was sort of downgrading the OBR, d um, no. less convinced about the Bank of England, um, I think this has been a reality check. And if anything, the strength of those institutions to say this is how we're going to act and you've got to adjust to it has been, has, uh, is greater. When you look at these forces, the UK, but also in the world, do you worry that the world economy is as precarious as it was in 2007, pre-financial crisis? No, I don't think, I don't think so. I think, um, looking at the world stage, obviously, inflation's got out of the bag. Yeah. Um, completely different situation, actually, yeah. to, 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 to the financial crisis. And maybe they were a bit slow. Uh, in the pandemic to see what was coming. But um, I think now um, they're on the case, interest rates are rising, it's very painful. I think we will see a recession across the West, but I don't see that the financial markets should yeah. implode. Um, a final question, because we talk so much about the Bank of England, but at some point you were also private secretary to the Chancellor. What advice would you give to this Chancellor? Well, I think um, 
My advice is the more you want to spend, the more you have to spend time convincing people that you'll be virtuous tomorrow. So to just produce 70 billion extra borrowing for the next six months, several hundred extra billion over the next few years, without any explanation of how you're going to pay for it, how you're going to bring it back to balance, I, I don't think he'll be doing that again. Thank you so much, Sir John Keeves. They're very diplomatic. The former Bank of England Deputy Governor joining us on what's happening in the UK. Now, coming up, more on the UK economy. Liz Truss's sweeping tax cuts may spell bad news for mortgage holders. So we look at the mortgage market next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now we're seeing two headlines cross the Bloomberg terminal from China. So China policymakers being a bit more intervene, well, uh, wanting to intervene more on the markets. Again, this was something that two, three weeks ago the market was disappointed that China was not doing enough. China now saying it's offering income tax breaks for some home purchases. That's to try and kickstart, of course, uh, some of not mortgages, but really house prices, one of uh, the biggest linchpins for the Chinese economy. And they were saying, um, just about 10 minutes ago also that they will do uh, some things when it comes to uh, FX. Uh, the China FX body saying they will ask banks to trade yuan closer to fixing. Now back to the UK and Liz Truss's sweeping tax cuts may end up being bad news for mortgage holders amid fears that the Bank of England will have to hike rates faster to compensate for looser fiscal policy. Well, deals for house purchases have been collapsing after lenders pulled mortgage products in response to soaring rates and market volatility. Now, for more, we're joined by Jonathan Tice from Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much. Um, great work actually trying to get this through and some of your reporting. How are the banks reacting today to the uncertainty? Good morning. Well, as your previous guest mentioned, um, because of the demand for some of the kind of legacy rates that are out of kilter with the incredibly quick moves in the market, they've been pulling offers and repricing, uh, and in some cases not even repricing yet. So a good example is HSBC. If you'd wanted a 95% land to value mortgage with them at the beginning of August, you'd have been offered about 3.7%, 3.8%. Um, as of last night's close, that was 6.65%. So they're hiking rates, um, but clearly there's still no visibility. So uh, with the swap rates that are used to price curves moving around so quickly, um, I would actually suspect that a lot of these offers, if you applied for them, doesn't mean you're going to get it approved either. Um, this is a very fluid market and it's only going one way. So, Jonathan, which areas out of all of these, of the mortgage market, are you most concerned about? Well, I think the, the high loan to value, first time buyer end, is a real concern because if you look at pricing over the past few months, because if you recall, the government introduced a help to buy scheme with, a, with effectively a guarantee at 95% loan to value level back in 2020. Some banks, NatWest, Barclays, for example, they will only offer uh, mortgages that um, price if they've got the guarantee. And because of that, the pricing has been very similar to a, a much bigger 75% loan to value with a bigger cushion pricing. The question is, that guarantee expires at the end of this year. Um, even with the stamp duty cuts, what happens to that very important step on the market? Um, we're waiting and seeing, but already we can see prices move a lot faster, a lot more quickly. And you think that politically, unfriendly headlines that will accompany the fact that first-time buyers, younger generations, will be effectively shut out of the market again, as they were when all the offers disappeared in early 2020. Um, that's definitely an area that we're expecting to see more in. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Jonathan Tice there from Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, coming up, your wide inflation numbers set to be revealed very shortly. So we'll look at what it means for the ECB and its fight against rising prices. That's next. This is Bloomberg. We will do what we have to do, which is to continue uh, hiking interest rates in the next several meetings. I think uh, for most of us, all of us, uh, 50 maybe the minimum. I would say my choice would be 75 basis points. Some were asked uh, 
Could it be 100? It could, but I don't see the necessity now to go as fast. It's also clear for now that we are below the neutral, uh, neutral rate. As long as we don't get to the peak of inflation, we will not have a clear pass uh, in terms of how far we need to go. Most probably it's, it's somewhere around, uh, around 2%, but uh, I, uh, I accept that there are different, different views. I wouldn't be surprised to see even higher inflation for September for Euro area than 9.1% that we saw in August. The distance to the interest rates that would ensure 2% inflation over medium term is still relatively wide so we can take big step uh, to speed this up and this is what we have to do returning inflation to two percent in the medium term if we uh, go back and forth uh, this will send uh, mixed signals to, to to the markets to the agents to our citizens and that's that's bad from hawkish to quite dovish, a range of different tones there from the ECB's governing council. Now, the latest euro area inflation figures are due to be released in the next few minutes. It's likely we'll see record numbers. So for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Yana Randa. So, Yana, how much pressure and a lot of pressure, and it's also so great to have you in London. Now, how much pressure is the ECB under? A lot. Um, whatever the rate will be, um, it's going to be really bad. It's going to be uh, close to uh, five times the ECB's target. The economists are predicting a rate of 9.7. That is far too high by any standard. And we've seen policymakers um, uh, uh, very nicely in this video basically saying 75% is what they expect um, for, for the next meeting. Uh, that's about four weeks away. A lot can happen still. That's what Philip Lane said. So, um, you know, he was pushing back a little bit yet, uh, yesterday saying there is still time. Let's, let's wait until we commit. Um, but, but yeah, um, if, if they're true to their words, um, being data dependent and wanting to get inflation back to 2%, then um, there is a clear path. So what is, I mean, if you look at that path, right, what can we expect for the rest of the year? And again, so it's, there's all this political turmoil in certain countries that complicates the situation even more. Absolutely. I think the first priority for, for um, policymakers there and, and the president, Christine Lagarde, uh, line this out quite nicely is to get to the neutral rate now um, that in itself is a concept that nobody quite <laughs> understands so um, our best guess is somewhere around two percent yeah. and if if you look we are at uh, at 75 basis yeah. points on the deposit rate now another 75 uh, puts us uh, to one and a half mm -hmm. um, there's another meeting coming up in in December so in the order of magnitude of 50 uh, in December 75 maybe who knows uh, will depend a lot on data forecasts um, get to neutral talk about Q QT and then see if more on the right front on restrictive is necessary and then the recession yeah. comes in and makes S it all more. S said like that it just sounds so simple right do this do that everything's fine but then you look at the UK and the turmoil that we've seen so what's the implication of that on the eurozone for example um, I think uh, I think what this is is a big warning sign uh, flashing there um, uh, mainly to governments uh, that What's, what, what can be perceived as, as, you know, reckless fiscal policy, as very irresponsible fiscal policy, uh, can actually uh, uh, create a lot of market uh, stress, a lot of market tension, and it can have real implications on what the central bank needs to do. Um, policymakers there in the ECB uh, world in Euroland have pointed that out, saying um, they want to see targeted and, and temporary, very tailored uh, measures to, to basically uh, help consumers, mm -hmm. companies through this crisis. They don't want to see blanket support because that is a stimulus in itself. That will drive prices, go counter to what the ECB is trying to do. Uh, and Lagarde has been, has been very outspoken. She said, look, uh, you guys better do this. Otherwise, we are going to be forced to act even more. You're not going to like it. So you're well advised to pay attention. Yana, thank you so much. Yana Randau there from the ECB team. Ms. Scoop Machine. She always gets the scoop, so check her out also on Twitter. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour with Katie Greifield and Kaylee Lines in New York. Anna Edwards here in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. 
It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. There's growing frustration that not enough's being done to solve Europe's natural gas crisis. EU ministers are meeting in Brussels to try to come up with a solution. The pound bounces back. Traders are now speculating that the British government will have to backtrack from policies that sent sterling plummeting to an all-time low. And Nike falls as profitability shrinks and inventory builds up. The largest U.S. maker of memory chips, Micron, is slashing production in response to plunging demand. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Katie Greifeld and Kaylee Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off today. Welcome to the program, Katie. And Kaylee, uh, the markets look really different today after a lot of heavy selling earlier on this week. Well, what's to worry about, it seems? Risk on today. Well, we'll see how long that lasts. It's been a bit of a roller coaster, Anna, on this very last trading day of the month of September and the third quarter. It is hard to believe we are here already, but it's been a pretty rough third quarter for a lot of assets, including for Asian equities. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index as a whole is set for its fifth consecutive quarterly loss. That is the longest streak of quarterly losses going all the way back to 2009. On a monthly basis for the month of September, it was the worst since 2008. And with a decline of four-tenths of a percent today, we're looking at a seventh consecutive weekly loss. In other asset classes, of course, it has also been a story in the bond and foreign exchange market. In the bond market, we are seeing uh, pressure put upward on yields globally, and that has been a bit of a problem for the Bank of Japan, which is trying to maintain that 25 basis point cap on the 10-year JGB yield. That is why you see them announcing even more bond buying overnight. That seems to be having somewhat of an effect as that 10-year yield is down around 24 basis points. But of course, the keeping of yield curve control and easy policy has been a continued weight on the Japanese yen, though it is gaining some strength against the U.S. dollar today. Right now trading at 144.28. Of course, Japanese officials seem to have drawn a line in the sand around that 145 level. That is where intervention stepped in, and they're also setting the stage for intervention in the Chinese yuan, which is weakening fractionally against the dollar once again today. We are back up at a 710 level, Katie. Well, Kelly, it is unambiguous in early U.S. trading that it is risk on. If you look at S&P 500 futures, up about 1% or so inching there. Uh, same thing if you look at the crude market as well. You have crude up above $82 a barrel, up about 1.4% at the moment. And Bitcoin singing the same song up about half a percent so far, actually underperforming equities right now. It had been uh, the reverse dynamic earlier in the week. But one of these things is not like the other, Anna, and that's what we're seeing in the Treasury market. You actually have yields falling to the tune of seven basis points on the benchmark 10-year Treasury yield. So we'll see which of these wins out as the day goes on. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see how that uh, plays out, that dynamic. We're risk on here in Europe when it comes to stock markets then, Katie. We've got European stocks moving higher, up by around nine-tenths of a percent in the German market and in the French market. It's pretty broad-based, actually. We see banking stocks, real estate stocks recovering some of their lost ground. There's a bit of read across from negativity after hours in the United States. We'll come to that in just a moment. Let me get to some of the breaking news out of Europe. We've had inflation data that's come through for the Eurozone. Hasn't moved the Euro all that much, I can report, but Euro area September consumer prices rising 10% year on year. The estimate was for an increase of 9.7%. So we are now in double digits in terms of inflation for the whole Eurozone. That is the aggregate. A lot of diversion geographically around that, uh, around that average, of course. Uh, but that's where we are, 10%. I guess we were sort of primed for this yesterday when we got the German number. That came out in double digits. And so the market possibly was looking ahead to something that might beat estimates. And that's what we got this morning. So that's why it didn't move the Euro, which was already a touch higher and remains so. 0 0.98 at 29. The two-year yield... And in, in keeping with what Katie was talking about, where, uh, the, the, where the yield dynamics are going this morning, we've got yields coming down. But that seems to be a story across the globe, not really specific to the UK. There's been a lot that has been specific to the UK over the past week, uh, but not the moving yields today, it would seem. So 4.13% is the yield on the two-year. Uh, the pound is at 111.94, so we bounce back on the pound. What is driving this, though? Is it uh, fundamentally different assessments of what we heard last week? Not particularly, according to strategists. It's more to do with the lead that the opposition Labour Party has now be uh, built up in the polls, the highest lead from any political party in the last 20 years. Will that put pressure on Prime Minister Liz Truss to U-turn, to backtrack on some of her plans? She's also meeting with the fiscal watchdog, the OBR, a little bit later on today, so we'll watch for any news out of that. And this is the transatlantic read across I was talking about, Kayleigh, down by 3.9% on the Adidas share price. Nike, of course, giving us something to think about, even though uh, Adidas had already given us a fairly gloomy assessment of where we were. It seemed there was further downside to go. 
All right, Anna, well, you were talking about the inflation story in Europe, and of course, energy is a huge part of that. And today, European Union energy ministers are meeting in Brussels to agree on a set of measures in order to tackle that gas crisis. We heard from the Czech energy minister earlier, who says more needs to be done. We are in the energy war with Russia. Uh, the winter is coming, and we need to act, as I said, now. Now means now. Now is today, maybe tomorrow. Now is not in a week and definitely not uh, in a month. So I expect the Commission to come with additional measures as soon as possible. All right, so more needs to be done. Let's find out if more will be done. Maria Tadeo, our European correspondent, joins us now. Maria, will the gas cap happen or not? No, oh, la la. What a, what, a, what a question. And uh, it, it is fundamentally the big debate happening here, and you can feel it. There's a lot of frustration uh, this morning when European ministers are, are gathering. This meeting is on its way now. It's it's underway and it's ongoing. But uh, the fundamental issue, and we go back to what is always a perennial problem for the European Union, is that these are 27 different countries with 27 different systems. And the issue right now is that they don't have a formula for it. They all agree and concede this. This is an energy war. We need to bring down prices. Bills need to go down. Inflation needs to go down. But they don't have the magic formula for the time being. There is frustration. There is disappointment uh, today. And from what I hear, the bar is pretty low. We're not going to get any progress out of this meeting, which that increases the pressure now for European leaders next week when they meet in Prague to come up with some type of solution. And Maria, of course, Germany announced a massive package. But does European unity still hold? Look, and, and that's a very good question because yesterday the German Chancellor came out with 200 billion euros to shield what he said uh, would be German households and businesses from this energy winter uh, crisis. Now, there is this morning behind the scenes some criticism that, if anything, this will create more distortions. And you have to remember that Germany is a country that says they do not agree with a gas cap. They feel that could lead to disruptions in the energy market. Well, the mm. flip side for some of the countries that do not have the fiscal space that Germany has is that, well, maybe it's Germany, after all, that's creating the biggest mm. disruption of all. Yeah, absolutely. We've heard from the Germans this morning. Maria, just to keep us all up to date, just a red headline across the Bloomberg says that the EU is backing a package to cut power use and allowing a windfall profit grab. Just briefly, Maria, that is in line with our expectations, isn't it, that they are uh, planning to cut power use and allowing a windfall tax? Anna, completely digested and priced in by the market. This was, in fact, announced by Ursula von der Leyen two weeks ago in Strasbourg. This is completely known and digested by markets. The real question, okay. and that, of course, there's no deal on it, is what to do with the gas prices, Anna. Okay, perfect. So we'll get uh, back, uh, we'll get more thoughts, of course, from the team in Brussels if we get any news on those gas prices. Thanks to Maria today reporting there from Brussels. Let's focus in on the UK economy. It grew in the second quarter, averting a summer recession despite the cost of living crisis. The news will be welcomed by the government, which has been hit by a run on the pound and a financial crisis since the mini budget last Friday. Let's get more with Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. Uh, Lizzie, I mean, I don't want to sound too surprised at the growth, but it was because the expectation was for a number that was not growth that was for contraction. This is going to set the mood to some degree for the Conservative Party conference that lies ahead. What do we expect? And don't forget, we're still expecting a slump to start in the third quarter when, of course, we had the National Bank holiday for the Queen's funeral. And given the, and we're looking at the pounds recovery, but perhaps that's because the Bank of England has stepped in uh, and shown that it's willing to help out. In terms of the mood heading into conference in Birmingham, the Tories are behind in the polls. There's a new poll overnight showing that Labour is ahead 33 points. That's the biggest poll lead for any UK political party in 20 years, all because of this fiscal package from the Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng. He, behind the scenes, is being weighed on to resign so that Liz Truss has the political cover to reverse the tax cuts, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Mm. Her, the uh, Chancellor and the Trade Secretary have been out defending vigorously these plans, so it's very awkward. But at conference, we're expecting Rishi Sunak, her rival to be leader, to sit it out in his constituency. And Lizzie, where does this leave us on the state of trustonomics, if you will? 
Well, it's very awkward because Liz Truss, if she carries on with her proposals, risks creating more turbulence in financial markets. Bank of America says that we could hit uh, dollar parity within the year. But if she backtracks, she would risk her credibility. What she could do is cut spending. Uh, but Bloomberg Economics reckons that she'd have to cut even deeper than George Osborne, the former chancellor, in the austerity years. So that would be politically unpalatable. She might get some ideas from when she goes to see the fiscal watchdog today, but I cannot understate how unusual it is that this meeting is happening uh, at this moment. And we've been having a debate on the economics desk what it means. Is it on the one hand uh, the government trying to weigh on the independent forecaster, or on the other hand is it the government accepting that it should have gone to the OBR in the first place mm. and perhaps the lack of credibility is what's roiled the markets? All right, Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden, thank you so much for your continued reporting on this. Clearly, there is a lot going on in terms of the macro picture, but there are some micro stories we need to keep track of as well. A couple of earnings news movers that we want to keep an eye on. Nike shares are slumping in pre-market trading after inventory surged, and they were forced to push through some margin-busting discounts that hurt profitability. We also have U.S. memory chip maker Micron slashing production to cope with a steep plunge in demand. Danny Berger is tracking those names and those moves for us and she's joining us now. Danny. Hey, Kaylee. Yeah, both of these stories, I mean, very different, but they're both kind of hangovers from adjusting away from the COVID world into something much different. So Nike, for example, it's all about inventory just being too high at a time when sales are slowing, when there's less demand, shares falling nine and a half in the pre-market session. It looks similar post-market, but essentially with all of the concern over supply chains, they really stocked up a lot. But because they had so much inventory, it me meant that they had to discount the their stock a lot. So margins were hurt not just by that, but also by strong dollar and just freight costs in general. And then you get to Micron. Again, it is a story of weakening demand. Uh, Micron, their estimates for sales missing by almost $2 billion. So shares are up pre-market 3.9%. It is a stress that has been largely priced in, especially to the consumer chip facing sector, considering we had uh, that Bloomberg scoop about Apple's warning. But it really is about the story of an earnings recession, something Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley and Michael Hartnett over Bank of America have been warning about. To what degree is that priced into equities? Do we need to see more cracks when it comes to the earnings story to really get equities to fair value, Anna? Yeah, a topic of conversation that we've had for weeks and no doubt we'll continue to have for, for, for weeks from here into the fourth quarter as we go shortly. Danny, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Danny Berger with the latest on the pre-market moves. Now, coming up on the program, we will speak to Simon French, Pamela Gordon, chief economist. He's somebody who knows the inside of the UK Treasury. He can shed some light on what's been going on over the past week and where we go from here. And on the EU energy meeting, Anne-Sophie Corbeau joins us, global research scholar at Columbia University Centre on global energy policy. We'll talk about the big picture from Brussels and also where all the Russian gas is going right now, plus deciding the fate of the Amazon. Today's Big Take story looks at how Brazil's election, which is due to take place this weekend could affect the fate of the world's largest rainforest. Read more online or on the Bloomberg Terminal. This is Bloomberg. No one covers the world like Bloomberg. Russia will then absorb these territories. What is NATO's reaction? Italy's Giorgia Meloni wins a clear majority, ushering in the nation's most right-wing government since World War II. Japan offers no sign that it is ready to stop tightening. With unmatched reach and resources from more than 120 countries, the moment news breaks, 24 hours a day. Bloomberg, your global business authority. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Katie Greifeld with Kaylee Lines in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller is off today. And it's the last trading day of the quarter, so let's get a look at the cross-asset volatility. This chart behind me shows Treasury volatility measured by this blue line here, the blue index, versus 
the VIX index in white. And as you can see, quite a divergence has opened up, even though it's felt like stocks have been pretty volatile, the bond market well outpacing that. For more, let's bring in Simon White. He is a strategist, a macro strategist at Bloomberg News. He joins us now. And Simon, when you think about this discrepancy that's opened up, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how these two lines come back together, whether it's going to be bond volatility easing a little bit here or whether stock volatility has to come up. Well, it's a very strange set of affairs. Um, so on the one hand, I think you have this very elevated bond volatility because when you know rates fall, as, uh, sorry, when rates rise, you get rises in volatility. Um, we've had very low liquidity in the treasury market right now, um, and that kind of feeds off one itself, right? You get low, low kind of liquidity, that means you end up with higher volatility. But the real curious thing is what's happening with the VIX. The VIX seems um, you know, way too low compared to a bunch of different things. Um, and it's way too low compared to, for instance, at the money volatility. And I think what's happening is the VIX is essentially an average of um, volatility across the whole curve. So people you know, from want to buy calls all the way down to people who want to buy puts. And what seems to be happening is that the, the volatility on puts is, um, is, is, is falling relative to calls. So people seem to have, bizarrely enough, lower demand for, if you like, kind of crash insurance right now. And I think that's what's been depressing the VIX. Mm, yeah, that's interesting, Simon, then, because would that lead you to conclude that the market is kind of convincing itself that maybe we're approaching the bottom, even though that seems to be an extremely live debate? Plenty of people saying, no, we're, we're nowhere near that yet. Yeah, that's exactly the conclusion I came to, because, um, you know, earlier on, people had the, the idea of what the Fed put was. And maybe the market is now thinking we're getting closer to where that Fed put is. So there's a kind of lower demand um, for these further out the money um, options. And that's keeping the VIX, um, as I say, slightly depressed. Now, it is rising. And I think, um, you know, I think it will continue to rise. If you look at, for instance, uh, people buying calls in the VIX itself. And um, so that's people thinking the VIX is going to rise from an option point of view. And um, that's been rising. And when that rises relative to, to put buying, you tend to get rises in VIX. So I think the VIX will continue to rise. Um, I think the, the move index will probably fall. So it'll be both, I think, will we'll, we'll do the adjustment and you'll get some sort of, um, I don't think they'll come together, but that's how the adjustment will happen with the VIX going higher and the move starting to go a little bit lower. So when are we going to know when buying the dip can win again, Simon? <laughs> that's the, uh, the, the, the big, big question. I mean, look, I think the biggest medium-term driver of equities is liquidity. And um, there's a number of ways of looking at liquidity, but one of the best ways is what's called excess liquidity. And that's the difference between real money growth and economic growth. And right now, that's low uh, and depressed. And not really until you see that starting to rise in a sustainable fashion. I think that you can be in a position where you think the bear market is over and you can get this sustainable rally in equities. Simon, thanks very much. Bloomberg, Simon White with the latest on volatility in the markets, where we're seeing it, where we're not, what's driving it. For more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on your Bloomberg terminal. That is the Markets Live blog. That's where it lives. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Katie Greifeld in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller is on assignment. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Hurricane Ian is now taking aim at South Carolina. The storm's winds picked up to 85 miles an hour overnight, and it's expected to make landfall today north of the historic city of Charleston. Ian caused catastrophic damage in Florida, where it came ashore as one of the strongest hurricanes ever to hit the U.S. The storm flooded towns on both coasts and wiped out entire neighborhoods. An unknown number of people are still believed to be trapped in their homes. Vladimir Putin is set today to annex parts of Ukraine that Russian troops control. That's after a referendum condemned by the United Nations and called a sham by President Biden. Russia plans to sign treaties to absorb the four Ukrainian regions. In Brazil, President Jair Bolsonaro and former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva traded insults in their last debate before Sunday's election. Bolsonaro called Lula a liar and an ex-convict. Lula accused Bolsonaro's government of corruption. He leads in the polls by a wide margin and could win in the first round if he gets more than 50% of the votes. 
And it's the end of an era at Facebook president or parent meta platforms. CEO Mark Zuckerberg has outlined plans to reorganize teams and reduce headcount for the first time ever. Zuckerberg says meta will likely be smaller in 2023 than it was this year. It's an admission that ad revenue growth is slowing in the midst of mounting competition for users' attention. And Katie, you can see those struggles reflected in Meta's share price. I just checked it out, down 59% so far this year. It's pretty remarkable. And you think about Meta trying to make this hard pivot into the metaverse. Investors clearly have been very skeptical of those efforts. What's interesting to me is that these are Meta-specific problems. We know tech has been suffering all year, but the NASDAQ 100, it's only down 31 percent this year. You compare that to Apple yeah. down 20 percent. I mean, Meta is in a class of its own. Right, yeah, indeed, for, for, for the wrong reasons in this particular case. And, and Katie, uh, interesting that they are blaming the, the performance of the economy. And interesting that we've seen this from other tech names. Mm -hmm. There may, may be specifics here around Meta, uh, to Katie's point, but there are uh, some broader themes around tech, the tech sell-off, of course, but also the extent to which we're seeing hiring freezes, like at Twitter. Uh, we've seen Google saying that it will slow hiring, for example. So this is a theme that we've seen elsewhere. Absolutely. And we know that Meta plans to spend a lot of money on the metaverse in the coming years. Uh, we'll see maybe if those plans have to adjust slightly now that we know that there is a plan to uh, freeze hiring, cut headcount, et cetera. Yeah. Absolutely. We'll pivot to a more macro conversation shortly. We'll be joined by Simon French, Pamela Gordon's chief economist, somebody who knows the inside of the Treasury here in the UK. He can talk to us about what's been going on in the past week, where the UK goes from here. We're building up to some interesting political developments, no doubt, next week. A Conservative Party conference taking place at a time where the poll lead for the opposition Labour Party is at a 20-year high. That is the context for the economic conversations here in the UK. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. There's growing frustration that not enough's being done to solve Europe's natural gas crisis. EU ministers are meeting in Brussels. They've come up with part of the solution. What will happen with the gas cap? The pound bounces back. Traders are now speculating that the British government will have to backtrack from policies that sent sterling uh, plummeting to an all-time low earlier this week. And Nike falls as profitability shrinks and inventory builds up. The largest U.S. maker of memory chips, Micron, is slashing production in response to plunging demand. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Katie Greifeld and Kayleigh Lines over in New York. Matt Miller is off today. And Katie, uh, there's more optimism in markets today, perhaps inexplicably, but we certainly had a lot of volatility to talk about earlier on this week when it came to bond markets, FX markets, not so much in stocks, but quite a lot of selling yesterday. Oh, big time. And you look at the uh, setup today, about four hours until U.S. markets open, it's still risk on but less so. If we look at the S&P 500 index in early trading right now, it's up about seven-tenths of a percent. We had been closer to one percent earlier in the morning. Some of those gains coming back now. Crude also still higher, less so. And Bitcoin still higher, but less so. Meanwhile, that rally in the bond market accelerating a little bit. You look at the 10-year Treasury yield now down about eight basis points at 3.7 percent, 4 percent. Feels like a long time ago, Kaylee. Yeah, it absolutely does. I also just have to say that I'm really proud that you knew it's four hours until the opening <laughs> bell because Matt has to ask me how many hours it is. I pretty thought much about it. I every thought day. about it. So that was pretty impressive. I want to get a quick check on the pre-market pre -market action now because you did have a number of companies reporting after the bell yesterday, one of them being Nike, which has a bit of a profitability problem on its hands. Gross margin came in under Wall Street expectations by 44%. The issue there is they have higher input costs. At the same time, they've seen their inventories build by 65%. So they're having to do heavy discounting in order to try to work that down. All of that putting pressure on the bottom line, which is why you're seeing Nike down about 9.4%, and it's dragging down other athletic apparel makers as well, the likes of Lululemon down by about 2%. Micron is an interesting story this morning as well. It too reported after the bell. It gave a revenue forecast for the current period, $2 billion below analyst expectations. What they are doing in the face of waning chip demand is pulling back on supply and CapEx. So maybe the fact that they're adjusting is what traders are taking a little more kindly 
into this morning with that stock up about three and a half percent. And one other company will be reporting before the bell. So in just a few hours uh, later on this morning, that is Carlinville Cruise Lines. Of course, we've seen it come under a little bit of pressure in recent days due to Hurricane Ian in Florida. But right now, ahead of those results, it's up about 3.6 percent before the bell, Anna. Kaylee, we've got European equity markets making gains today up by just shy of 1%. Of course, we lost substantial ground yesterday and we're not making up all of that today. Uh, but we are seeing a little bit of a, a rebound in risk sentiment, perhaps because of the weakness in the dollar giving risk assets a chance to rally, but we're up by a percent on the European stocks this morning. We're rethinking some of the weakness around UK assets just today. Uh, we spent the whole week talking about weakness in the pound, higher gilt yields. Uh, those two trends have been unwinding a little bit and we seem to be back to where we started really on the pound, but some of the threats still remain. The bank of England has been actively calming nerves, it seems, in gilt markets. That spilt over into the FX markets, perhaps. But also, perhaps, investors are, are betting that there might be a U-turn, a political U-turn and a, and a rethink from the governing Conservative Party. And that might be what is behind the bounce in sterling that we're seeing. That has been certainly something mentioned by strategists. And in keeping with that, we see that the uh, two-year yield, and in fact, across the curve, and this is more of a global theme today, we do see risk-on moves and yields coming down a little bit. Uh, Adidas is uh, down by 410 uh, sorry, 4%. This on the back of what you were talking about, Kaylee, that Nike story, so Adidas, or Adidas if you prefer, is <laughs> trading weaker, even despite the fact they've already been downgraded by a number of analysts this cycle, and they'd already told us some of the gloomy things uh, to do with their trading situation, but of course that read across came loud and clear from Nike over the Atlantic. Yeah, if Matt were here again, he'd be giving us a lesson on the proper pronunciation of these German companies. <laughs> I do want to get back to the UK story, though, as well. Joining us now is someone who definitely has thoughts, Simon French, Pan Gordon, chief economist, who has been on fire on Twitter over the last week, since a week ago Friday when Quasi Quartang shook the world. Anna was just talking about, Simon, how the pound is basically back to where it was before he made those policy announcements. You can probably largely thank the Bank of England for that. Yet Liz Truss mm. still seems like she is not going to make a U-turn. She wants to stay firm in those policies. So my question to you is what happens next? Yeah, morning, Kelly. And absolutely right that we haven't seen much signs of a policy U-turn from the government. Um, very much saying the plan for growth has considerable merit in terms of raising trend growth in the UK economy. An analysis I wouldn't necessarily disagree with. I think what is if you like reassuring markets, putting a floor under sterling, leading to a bit of a relief rally, is what it, when you say what is coming next, there are signs that the government is listening to the reaction to what has been an institutional scorched earth policy over the course of the summer. They've sidelined their independent um, Office for Budget Responsibility who do assessments, the costings of their package. Now they're bringing them back into the tent. They've slagged off the Bank of England, but the Bank of England got them out of a hole earlier in the week. Mm -hmm. There are signs here that they are listening and they're doing what they probably should have done ahead of last Friday, which is get those independent institutions to give them air cover to their plan. They're doing it late, they're doing it after the event, but that is probably going to be a continuation over the next few weeks as they try and gradually rebuild credibility with the markets. OK, Simon, good morning to you. So, yeah, interesting to see them trying to build credibility with the market. And this meeting with the OBR today will be interesting. Mm. That takes us into next week, Conservative Party conference. A lot of C Conservative MPs choosing not to go if they yep. don't agree with the policies that have been announced recently. Uh, but the Prime Minister has to give a speech. And she usually, that whoever the Prime Minister is, they usually like to play to the room. Mm -hmm. The more she tries to play to the room, the more she could upset the markets would seem to be what we've learned from last Friday. It's an unenviable trade-off that she's got to make in terms of providing some red meat to the faithful uh, versus very mindful that the not just UK markets, world markets will be looking at what she says in terms of substance. The more difficult backdrop that she has also is it's not just financial markets that are taking a pretty bad assessment. We've had opinion polls out in the UK of the last sort of 24, 48 hours mm. that have suggested the ruling Conservatives are anything up to 33 percent behind the Labour Party, which would almost completely wipe out the Conservatives if it was replicated in a general election. Now, I don't think many political commentators would suggest that that is a likely outcome, but it certainly will be some scaring some Conservative MPs, and they will be pushing the Prime Minister to try and sound a little bit more statesman-like, mm. statesperson-like, and, and actually sound like they've understood the gravity of what this means, these moves in guild markets, which can feel quite remote, yeah. what it means for UK businesses businesses, households in terms of their debt servicing costs, their mortgages, because there's a lot of fear out there. Yes, because these guilt 
yields, they were rising very quickly. The Bank of England stepped in, but that yeah. was a temporary operation, they have, they have told us. And now the Bank of England has to make a decision. So they put up interest rates in the way that maybe those who've been putting money into the... Uh, or those who were selling the pound had been asking them to, mm. or do they not do that because they're fearful of tipping the housing market over? I mean, if you took uh, yields up to 6%, what would that do to the housing market in the UK? Just for the international audience, yes. the, the housing market is, is really crucial to the UK economy, and what, it can't handle rates as high as 6%? Well, there's about £1.4 trillion worth of outstanding mortgage debt. That's about 70% of GDP. Um, the good news, if you like, is that about 80% of that is on a fixed rate, and therefore that delays the moment of pain for a lot of households, but 20% is on variable rates, and they'll see an instantaneous, almost instantaneous mm. pass-through. But you get about 1.2 million households. What is that? That's about 5% of households over the course of the next 12 months who will start to come off those, those rates. That j gradual ratchet up, in a macro sense, will be gradual, but on a micro sense, will be very, very significant in terms of the disposable income of those households concerned. And I think that is the fear. It passes through to consumer confidence mm. and hence a risk of real precautionary saving and a slowdown in consumer okay. demand. Okay, Katie, jump in. And Simon, from your perspective, what is the more dominant force in the UK economy right now? Is it fiscal policy or is it monetary policy? Well, we have a fear of fiscal dominance. It's an absolutely the right question to ask. So fiscal dominance is when the actions of the fiscal authority, in this case the Treasury, are making the ability of the monetary authority, the Bank of England, not to be able to do its job. It's, it's constraining it. And I think we saw signs of that in the last couple of days. There is no doubt that the Bank of England's intervention on financial stability grounds to delay the start of quantitative tapering or active quantitative tapering in the UK was the right decision given the scale of the volatility. But we cannot get away from the fact that that is net at the margin. Mm. It is inflationary at a time the UK inflation is running at 10%. So fiscal policy is dominating monetary policy, and that is quite a difficult uh, look, if I'm honest, at a time when you want to, if you like, elevate the idea that the Bank of England is an independent uh, right. operator in terms of how it's dealing with the UK economy. Well, and let's talk about the Bank of England's independence or insulation from other central banks. I mean, what's the bleed through from the Bank of England having to act in this way to the ECB or the Federal Reserve as they also are moving to tighten policy? Well, it's the right question as well because UK macro, let's be honest, it's it doesn't often get global attention. The UK economy is 2 to 3% of the global economy, and therefore the spillover, the contagion spillover of domestic policy decisions is generally quite limited. I've been, you know, very vocal in my research, my commentary on saying that, you know, in most markets, the UK is a price taker, not a price maker. But I think such is the scale of if you like, market angst to what was a big expansion in the fiscal envelope in borrowing that, let's be honest, today has been largely replicated in Germany in terms of their energy market intervention. The fear will be that actually the UK not so much has made a policy mistake, but is the first mover of how financial markets may react mm. more widely to big expansion in primary deficits to deal with what is a big exogenous shock in energy markets. It certainly touched a nerve, didn't it, Simon? Mm. <laughs> Simon French, <laughs> Pam, you're Gordon. Thank you very much for joining us. Really good to uh, speak to Simon ahead of that important Conservative Party conference next week. Now, coming up on this programme, we'll stick with the theme of energy markets and how that feeds into inflation and the broader global uh, macro story. And Sophie Corbeau joins us, Global Research Scholar at the Centre on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an exclusive interview with General Motors President Mark Royce. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Katie Greifeld and Kayleigh Lines over in New York. And Kayleigh, uh, we've got European ministers meeting to try to resolve issues around the energy policy in Europe, to try and take some bold action. In amongst that, we're seeing national governments taking action. We've seen the German government, as Simon was just referencing, uh, setting out their plan. They're very against the idea of a broad cap on the price mm -hmm. of gas. They'll be meeting with the French leadership on Monday, we now understand. Uh, so that's the European story. I know this is obviously something that has been very polit uh, political, has political implications in the United States, and clearly has political implications, as we've seen in the UK over the past week. Yeah, it absolutely does. And it's a question for me of whether you get some fractures within the allies, who in large part have acted together at, during the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. They have managed to maintain kind of that coalition. And I just wonder, given the magnitude of this energy crisis and the degree to which it is affecting these economies and putting pressure domestically on these leaders, if their ability to agree is going to start to wither, Katie. And you wrap that into the markets and you wonder what it means for a very stressed out global equity market picture. We know that in times of volatility, obviously correlations go to one. It feels like every global equity market is taking their cues from mm. the UK at this moment. Right, that's the sort of macro backdrop. Let's get uh, into a conversation about where we go on energy markets. And Sophie Corbeau joins us, global research scholar at Columbia University, and can shed some light on energy policy here. Uh, good to speak to you, and Sophie. There seems to be disagreement uh, amongst European leaders around whether a cap on the price of gas would be a good thing or not. What's your view? Absolutely. I mean, I think there has been an agreement on capping electricity prices, as announced by Mrs. van der Leyen in her State of the Union address on the 14th of September. However, they do not agree on how to cap gas prices, because gas prices are very much international. So one of the ideas is to cap the gas prices which prices, which is coming from Russia. But some people fear that then Russia is going to cut the remaining uh, gas flows going to Europe. Another idea, because people have noticed that the TTF gas price, uh, one of the major spot prices in Europe, is disconnected, or as Mrs. van der Leyen put it, has not adapted to the current situation. And there is indeed a very big disconnect between this price, the TTF price, and the imported LNG price. This is essentially due to the bottlenecks. So one of the ideas which I has been announced is to maybe use uh, this uh, LNG price benchmark instead of the TTF. But this is also creating some issues because such uh, indices are not as liquid as a TTF. And if you want to create another benchmark, it takes years. I mean, it has taken a decade for TTF to become as liquid, as transparent as we see today. Another idea has been, well, let's cap import prices in general, but then this is going to have unintended consequences because if you are capping, for example, LNG prices, then the LNG is going to go somewhere else. And one of the major sources of gas to replace missing Russian gas has been LNG. So if Europe is no longer able to attract LNG, then Europe is going to have a serious gas problem. Well, and it becomes a question not just of supply, but of demand. That is something that they all seem to have a bit more agreement on, the idea that you need to bring demand down. To what degree does that realistically need to happen with the energy resources Europe looks like it's going to have available? It is absolutely necessary, and I, 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 I would have hoped that the ministers would have realized that a little bit earlier than, you know, when Russian gas was really cut in June, and then they came up with this safe for gas for a safe winter plan. I mean, the problem is that we are not getting enough gas. This is a fundamental supply problem. Now, Russian gas is done at 20 percent of what it was uh, in, on average in 2021. So we need to do something in terms of demand. And there are essentially three big sectors. There is residential use, there is industry, and there is power generation. Right now, industrial gas use is really down. It's really down because industries are starting to cut output. Residential use, as you may have seen in Europe, there is a lot of pressure and advice to residential users to limit their consumption. A lot has to be done there. And finally, the use of gas in power generation has been increasing, mostly for two reasons. Nuclear and hydro are done year on year. Nuclear mostly because of the decommissioning of nuclear power plant in Germany and because of the French issues. And hydro because we have had not enough rain, not enough 
snow during winter and also a heat wave during summer. So this has really put a, a very has had a very strong consequences and impact on hydro levels. And Anne Sophie, on the topic of these gas caps, which are being discussed, we know that France and Spain are in support. We know that Germany opposes. And from your perspective, is there enough unity in Europe at this moment to implement these caps? I think, I mean, it's particularly complicated to have unity because, you know, some people fear that there will be unintended consequences with price caps. I mean, you know, people always find or companies always find a way to basically go around the price caps and things that you thought were going to be OK and a good idea in general have then, you know, some over consequences on the market. I think it is, I mean, an idea and a good idea to try to reduce the, the price. Well, electricity is definitely moving forward. Gas is looking very complicated. But, you know, the problem is how do you do that in practice and how do you ensure that there will not be over consequences that you had not anticipated? Yes, we've already heard from Germany saying that they won't cap gas prices in Germany. They want to go a different route. They're going to be meeting with the French on Monday, no doubt, to talk about that, amongst other things. And sophie thank you so much for joining us. And sophie Corbeau of Columbia University, thanks very much for your time this morning. Coming up in the next hour, UK Financial Secretary to the Treasury, Andrew Griffith, will be talking to the Bloomberg surveillance team. That's at 6 a.m. in New York, 11 a.m. in London. What can he add to what we already know about the UK's fiscal plans? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Katie Greifeld in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller is on assignment. Now let's take a look at what's ahead today. As we've already mentioned, EU energy ministers are meeting in Brussels on the power crisis. There will be a press conference from the Czech presidency and European Commission at 7.45 a.m. New York time. Russia will also sign treaties to absorb the four regions in eastern and southern Ukraine at a Kremlin ceremony at 8 a.m. Eastern. Putin will also make an address to legislators and other officials. We'll also be hearing from Fed speakers, including Fed Vice Chair Lael Brainerd and New York Fed President John Williams, plus a new show, Crypto IRL, hosted by our very own Katie Greifeld and Tim Stenovic, airs at 8 p.m. New York time on Bloomberg Quick Take and 8.30 p.m. on Bloomberg Television. Let's get a sneak peek. I think the challenge with crypto is so many people in 2021 especially, we saw this in 2018 and before that in 2014, yeah. so many people view crypto and so many people online marketed crypto as a way to get rich quick. So people were marketing a lot of these things as an easy button and as you and I and everyone knows, right, there is no easy button. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the challenge is that a lot of people had incentives to market certain things as safe, to encourage people to invest in certain things, and also people don't want to do their diligence. The point I'm making and what I'm trying to illustrate is this is not a phenomenon that's unique to crypto. It exists in all parts of the market. Can I just say, to maybe defend the crypto industry a little bit more, think about the traditional currency industry. Forex scammers on Instagram, I just can't. I went, before basically crypto exploded in the way it did in the pandemic. So my favorite accounts on Instagram were these like forex scammers, like <laughs> flexing like their Gucci's and yes. their Ferraris. But on the private well, chat, with yes, like the, I yeah. love. I, I think you make a good point though. Yeah, but you're not yeah. seeing those advertised in the Super Bowl. No, no, you know? but. So it, 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 it did. It did reach a different level. But some of, are you saying of the cultural zeitgeist? Well, I mean, a forex scammer is different from like Coinbase buying a Super Bowl ad. Right. Which, by the way, but I love not... that Super Bowl ad. Was that the QR code? It was just the bouncing QR code bouncing QR around. Code. I'm like, yeah. it's kind of a baller move to spend yeah. millions of dollars on a little so bouncy I, QR code. So it sounds like the, the, I mean, in your opinion, the industry does not have anything to apologize for. It's more like. I think apologize is a challenging word. I think there are certain individuals who maybe behaved in a way that is not great, but I'm not a judge, I'm not a jury, I'm not an executioner. I do my best to not engage in that behavior. I never tell people, invest in this, buy this, do mm -hmm. this. Um, so I can't speak for that. I'm not the moral compass of the industry. Well, it's very generous. Thank you for that promo. But yeah, premieres tonight. We've been working on it for a mm. long time. So uh, 
Tune in. Yeah. As you can see, it's pretty casual, pretty fun. <laughs> pretty casual. All I can say is I want a different backdrop. <laughs> that, that, this is no good anymore. Katie, thanks very much for joining us. More surveillance follows. This is Bloomberg.